Our scripture reading this morning is 1 Corinthians chapter 9, starting with verse 19. 1 Corinthians 9, verse 19. These uh, are interesting letters, letters from Paul. He says, Though I am free and belong to no man, I make myself a slave to everyone, to win as many as possible. To the Jews I became like a Jew, to win the Jews. To those under the law I became like one under the law, though I myself am not under the law, so as to win those under the law. To those not having the law I became like one not having the law, though I am not free from God's law but am under Christ's law, so as to win those not having the law. To the weak I became weak, to win the weak. I have become all things to all men, so that by all possible means I might save some. I do this all for the sake of the gospel, that I may share in its blessings. Do you not know that in a race all the runners run, but only one gets the prize? Run in such a way as to get the prize. Everyone who competes in the games goes into strict training. They do it to get a crown that will not last. But we do it to get a crown that will last forever. Therefore, I do not run like a man running aimlessly. I do not fight like a man beating the air. No, I beat my body and make it my slave, so that after I have preached to others, I myself will not be disqualified for the prize. This is the word of God. Will you continue to worship and pray with me, please? Heavenly Father, we respond to your Spirit, whom you have sent to live with us and be in us forever. Thank you for your precious Spirit of love, of hope, of faith. And we pray, dear Father, we've heard the words of your Son, Jesus, his commands to go, to go and bear fruit, to go and make disciples. And we pray that your Spirit would lead us to understand how we might go, how we might obey those commands. And we pray for those who have obeyed, who have gone to the farthest most reaches of the earth. We pray for Josh and Bethany Weeks and their children. You have sent them to the Wolani people, the people for whom Jesus has died. They need the gospel. They need to be saved. They need eternal life. They need freedom and hope and victory. They need the word of life. We pray that you would empower and lead and support Josh and Bethany as your ambassadors, as ministers of the gospel for a great and abundant harvest. We also pray for Roger and Terry Wall, Thank you for their faithful service over the years to serve at two small churches, kind of at the ends of the earth in their own way. Nobody, nobody even knows that they're there. They're small, but they are worth the life of your son. Those churches belong to Jesus, and we pray that you would lead and empower Roger and Terry to minister to them, to preach and teach the word of God in all its truth and power, that your spirit could Use your word there and that Jesus Christ could build those churches, build them up into men and women, even like Jesus. So we pray this morning for this church. Thank you for our pastors, our elders, our deacons, and pray that you might lead and empower them to point us to Christ. For it is, is in his, his name that we pray. All to your glory, Lord Jesus. All to your praise forever. Amen. Okay. Not so scary this time. We'll see. We will see. Getting a little scarier. All right. We're all going to pray together. I'm going to take this off. This is what I'm going to do. 
not often that you can come to church, have a fellow brother and pastor make fun of your jeans right before you get ready to preach. But because my jeans are too weird, I put this in my shirt pocket. I love Charles, but there are a few things that irritate me more when he's right and I'm wrong. <laughs> Let's pray for me. Father, thank you for Charles, Lord, and the blessing that he is. Thank you for uh, this microphone working. Thank you that um, you are gracious to us in Christ. That we could gather together today, Lord, that we could worship you, Lord, as we gather together to rekindle, I pray, this new year in our hearts, Lord, those things most central to your heart, those things that you have called and commissioned your church to do, and so we ask for your blessing, Lord, not only today, not only in the preaching and reception of the word of God, but Lord, as we receive your word, would you lead us to walk in faithfulness? Would you renew a zeal within us for the great commission, Lord, that we would reach people with this glorious message of hope and truth through Jesus? Father, would you do that for us? Lord, awaken, refresh, rekindle, Lord, this new year for us, these great and glorious old truths and callings that you've placed upon us. We ask that you would do this in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to take the time over the next two weeks and then, Lord willing, the first and last sermons in February to spend a little time just in this new year talking about vision and purpose for the church. What is the vision of a, of a healthy biblical church? What should we as Christians envision our life being? How should we think about our days as we go about living as members of the church and as Christians following Jesus? It's important in Proverbs 29 and verse 18 we read this. Where there is no vision, the people are unrestrained. But happy is he who keeps the law. Now, the idea of vision there isn't, isn't exactly the way we're using the word here. Speaking specifically of a vision like a dream or a vision that God would give to somebody. But as we read in Hebrews chapter 1, we know that long ago that, that God spoke to the fathers in the prophets in many portions and in many ways. Now, this includes visions and dreams. What was God doing? God was working through his prophets and he was communicating himself and his will to the people. And that God did that long ago in many different ways, in many different forms of revealing himself. But then in verse 2, we read this. In these last days, he has spoken to us in a son. In these last days, God is speaking to us in a distinct way, a way different than he did before the coming of Christ. In these last days, God is communicating his nature, his attributes, who he is, and his will for us in and through the person and work of Jesus Christ. So as we think about that, as we look back to what we read in Proverbs, we read here where there is no vision. What is the, what is the author trying to communicate to us here? That when there is no communication from God, when there is no revelation from God of who he is and what he calls us to do, then the people, it says, live unrestrained. That they are living, as it were, loosely, not restrained. And, and this leads to debauchery and unruliness in the people of God, and it leads to ineffectiveness in all that God has called his people to do. They will be out of control. They will, be out of, they, they will neglect the things that they're supposed to care about, and ultimately depravity will spread when there is no communication from God. Now here is the kicker. Here's the glorious part for us that God has definitively communicated to us in and through the person of Christ so that we are never without this. God has inscripturated that for us in the word of God. And so then the question becomes, and, and a new year is a great time to do this. New year is full of resolutions, isn't it? Where people are resolved in their heart to do new things. And I would, I would encourage us in this way. I would encourage us this new year to be resolved not ultimately to do something new, but to grab hold of those great, those old, those ancient and central things that God has called his church to do, but to think about them in new ways, to look at them afresh this new year. And so as we think about 
purpose and vision of the church. We're going to be working through this. And today we want to look at this idea that the title of the sermon is Making Christ Known. And what we want to do is we want to look at the church's first calling. Let me say that again. This is our first and primary calling. We want to look at this, the idea of evangelism, of sharing the gospel of proclaiming the good news of Jesus Christ throughout all creation, the church's first calling is evangelism, is testifying and spreading the good news about Jesus. Now, we live, and sadly, we live in an age, especially in America, in the Western cultures, where churches are dying. Churches are in decline Churches are dying all the time. Churches are shutting their doors. Oftentimes where a a vibrant or thriving church would have existed 100 years ago or even 50, 30 years ago, there's nothing but plywood on windows. A place where Jesus Christ used to be exalted and God the Father glorified through, through people coming to faith and bowing down in worship by the power of the Holy Spirit is now nothing but dust and cobwebs. Tom Rainer who writes uh, through LifeWay Publishing, was the former president, just retired, of of LifeWay. He he was used as a consultant, and he was brought into a lot of these struggling churches for the purpose of revitalizing them. And after his work, through many years of doing this, Tom Rainer has published a book called The Autopsy of a Deceased Church. And he looks at 14 churches specifically that have ultimately, ultimately closed down, churches that have died, And he looks into them, asking the question, could something have been done? What was going on in these churches? And he's done it for the benefit, he says, not of those churches as some sort of a shame on you, not at all, but with their permission and their help so that those of us that remain will be aware of these things, so that those of us that remain will be able to live and to flourish. And so I want to do something that I don't usually do. I want to read for you guys some excerpts out of some of his stuff. It was very helpful. Tom Rainer writes, and the heading is this, the autopsy, the common thread. The common thread in churches that died. And he says this, the most pervasive and common thread of our autopsies was that the deceased churches lived for a long time with the past as hero. They held on more tightly with each progressive year. They often clung to things of the past with desperation and fear. And when any internal or external force tried to change the past, they responded with anger and resolution, we will die before we change. And they did. Hear me clearly, Rainer writes. These churches were not hanging on to biblical truths. They were not clinging to clear Christian morality. They were not fighting for primary doctrines or secondary doctrines or even tertiary doctrines. As a matter of fact, They were not fighting for doctrines at all. They were fighting for the past, the good old days, the way it used to be, the way we want it to be today. For sure, there were some prophets and dissenters in these churches. They warned others that if the church did not change, it would die. But the stalwarts did not listen. They fiercely resisted. The dissenters left, and the death came closer and closer. This is true of so many places, and it's, it's, it's one of the most ever-present dangers of an established church, and there are so many good things that we embrace and that we do, that the, the testimony for Christ and the culture and all of that, but we have to guard ourselves. Rainer goes on to ask this question as he writes. He says, do you know the name Harry Truman? And then he says, let me be clear. Do you know the name Harry Randall Truman? No, he was not a former president. He was a homeowner at the foot of Mount St. Helens in Washington State in 1980. Harry Truman lived in the projected path of the biggest lava flow that would come after the eruption. One expert said as they talked to Truman that that the potential and the percentage that this would indeed erupt was almost 100%. It was inevitable. His family begged him to leave. The authorities pleaded with him to leave. But Harry Randall Truman would not leave. He could not give up his home. He could not let go of the past. One person told Truman that staying was tantamount to suicide. Truman still would not leave. And do you know what happened? On May 18th, 1980, 
Mount St. Helens erupted. The lava flowed right where they predicted it would flow. And on May 18th, 1980, Harry Randall Truman died because he couldn't let go of his house. His family mourned his loss in much the same way that our communities, without even knowing it, are mourning the losses of churches in the world around us. Rayner says then, so what did the deceased churches cling to? And after he lists, th- lists a few things, he talks about worship styles or the order of service, and we could add to that many things, the forms of evangelism, not evangelism, but the way that we do it, the forms of reaching our community. Rayner writes this, but more than any one item, these dying churches, now remember, this is an autopsy of 14 churches, and, and we could say this about many, many others, but more than any one item, these dying churches focused on their own needs instead of others. They looked inwardly instead of outwardly. Their highest priorities were the way that they've always done it and that which made them the most comfortable. It was not just the past that they revered. It was their own personal good old days, Rayner says. So unlike the heroes of Hebrews 11 who held on to nothing in this life, these dying churches held on to everything at least everything that made them happy and comfortable. Such is the reason, Rainer says, that we speak of them in the past. Their focus was inward, not outward. Many churches begin with a zealous heart for evangelism, and that's how the church grows and functions, and then we begin to point inward. We begin to look at our needs and our desires and the church body and how do we do this and that, and we lose a focus on the fact that God has called us to gather together within these walls for the purpose of being built up and equipped to go out there to make Christ known. That people would come to Christ in faith and what we saw up there today should be a regular occurrence in the churches. That we should have scheduling problems because of so many baptisms. Now, of course, we know this is all dependent on the Lord's work. But when the people of God are faithful to do the work that God has called him to do, God will be faithful to empower them and bring about the purposes he has promised and planned. Now, we see this, we see this autopsy, this depiction, and we ask ourselves the question, is there hope? Is there anything that we can do about this? Another writer, David Platt, in a book called Radical, tells a story of a time when he was in Africa, in the Sudan, and he was visiting with one of his friends, and they were sitting there, and the the man's name was Bolin. And Bolin, as a young child, had been separated from his family, and he was was forced to grow up in the war-ravaged Sudan all by himself. But he he was a zealous follower of Jesus. He loved the Lord, and him and David Platt, now David Platt is a uh, has a PhD in the States and is a was a pastor of a mega church and then was the former um, head of missions for the Southern Baptist Convention, a huge worldwide organization, and now pastors another large church in Washington, D.C. And him and David Platt were discussing each of their lives, talking about what God was doing in their lives. Platt writes this. In the middle of that conversation, Bullen lowered the cup of hot tea from his lips looked me in the eyes and said, David, I am going to impact the world. An interesting statement, Platt writes. Here's a guy in the African bush with almost no resources. A guy who hadn't seen much of the world beyond the villages that surrounded him. A guy who by all outward appearances did not have much hope of changing the world, let alone his own life. Bolin How are you going to impact the world, Platt asked. I'm going to make disciples of all the nations, he said. So, Platt responds, you're going to impact the world by making disciples of all the nations. That grin immediately spread across his face. Why not, he answered. And then he went back to sipping his tea. Platt says, I'll never forget those two words. Why not? not. Here's this guy in the Sudan, all by himself, sitting here with a mega church pastor, a a guy who is renowned in all of this, and I don't know if Platt was at the time or not, but this American guy with seemingly all the resources at his fingers, and it's the guy from the bush who says, David, I'm going to impact the world. And David Platt says, well, how are you going to do that? 
I'm going to make disciples of all the nations. Platt writes, as I lay down that night beneath the thatched roof of a mud hut, I could not get Bullen's question out of my mind. He had asked it with such innocent, idealistic passion. He was not only optimistic enough to think that he could actually affect the world around him, but he was also confident enough to know how he was going to do it. He really believed that in obeying Jesus' command to make disciples, he was going to impact the world. And then Platt closes with this. I want to propose that the plan Bolin identified for his life is the same plan that Jesus has identified for all of our lives. Make disciples of all the nations. And we may be sitting here today, 2,000 years removed from the cross and asking ourselves, but yet yeah, Really? Can that really happen? I mean, are you kidding me? Can we really impact the world like Bolin imagined? Is this even possible? Could something like this ever happen? And the testimony of not only scripture, but history is a resounding yes and amen. And what hinders it is exactly what Rainer talked about. When we lose focus on the church's first primary, foundational, and ultimate calling to make disciples... And to that note, one more extended reading here. Is it possible? David Anderson, in his book, Christ's Kingdom Commission, quotes Albert Barnes, who is a a couple generations ago, a commentator. He has notes on the New Testament. And Barnes says this. Within the space of 30 years after the death of Christ, the gospel had been carried to all parts of the civilized and to no small portion of the uncivilized world. 30 years. Barnes continues. Its progress and its triumphs were not concealed. Its great transactions were not done in a corner. It had been preached in the most splendid, powerful, and enlightened cities. Churches were already founded in Jerusalem, Antioch, Corinth, Ephesus, Philippi, and at Rome. The gospel spread to Arabia, Asia Minor, Greece, Macedon, Italy, and Africa. 30 years. 30 years. It had assailed the most mighty existing institutions that had made its way over the most formidable barriers. It had encountered the most deadly and most malignant. It had traveled to the capital. It had secured such a hold even on the imperial city as to make it certain that it would finally be overturned and overrun the established religion and seat itself, the gospel, the kingdom, the church would seat itself on the ruins of paganism. It's happened. It's happened before. It's happened by virtue of the power of the same Holy Spirit that each one of us Christians possesses within us right now. The power of God has not diminished. The people of God have not gotten better or worse than they were then. If you don't believe me, just read about Peter for a little bit. Peter could be any one of us sitting right here pulling a sandal out of his mouth. Barnes finishes, within 30 years, it had settled the point that it would overturn every bloody altar, close every pagan temple, bring under its influence men of office, rank, power, and that the banners of the faith would soon stream from the palaces of Caesar. Is it possible? Amen, it's possible. The call hasn't changed. The commission that Christ has given us hasn't changed. And the power to accomplish it has not diminished one bit. And with that in mind, we want to look this morning at a few verses. Familiar verses. Verses that all of us have read. If you've been in the church any amount of time, you've read this over and over again. If you have not been in the church, you have probably heard some of these. Turn with me to Matthew 28, beginning in verse 18. We refer to this with good reason as the great commission. Christ has commissioned his people to great things, to great purposes. It is a great privilege to be a part of this. Great things will be accomplished. We serve a great king. There is a reason that it is a great commission. Matthew chapter 28, beginning in verse 18. And Jesus came up. Remember, this is after his resurrection, prior to his ascension. And Jesus came up and spoke to them, saying, 
All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go, therefore. Here's the commission. Here's the one imperative, the one command in there. And make disciples of all the nations. There's the singular commission that Christ gives his church. Make disciples of all the nations. Now, what we see is this. We see this explained now and how we're going to do it in two parts. He goes on to say, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit and teaching them to observe all that I commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Now, one thing I want us to notice in this is that central to this commission is the work of evangelism. Evangelism is central to the disciple-making commission. It cannot be understood apart from evangelism. As a matter of fact, as we look, we understand, as we look at Acts chapter 2, if you have your Bibles, just flip over to Acts chapter 2. We're going to begin in verse 37 and 38, but you remember Acts chapter 2, the day of Pentecost. There are people gathered together for the festival of Pentecost and The Holy Spirit descends upon the apostles so that they are proclaiming the gospel for people to hear. They are preaching the gospel. And then we see Peter. Peter gets up and Peter preaches a sermon. People don't know what's going on. They ask Peter, man, these apostles, they're they're preaching. And and for the apostles, what what seemed like to them, just preaching in their normal language. and, And all sorts of people were hearing it in their native tongue. And so some of the people say, well, man, these guys are a little bit tipsy. They've been hitting the bottle. It's pretty early, but they started in early. And Peter says, that's not what's happening. He says, this is in fulfillment of what the prophet Joel said would take place in the last days. And it's been now happening to us. The Holy Spirit has been poured out. And Peter proceeds with the empowering of the Holy Spirit to preach the message of the gospel, to evangelize those around him. And then we get to verse 37. Now remember, those around him were many of them were responsible for the crucifixion of Jesus, for handing Jesus over to Pilate, crying out, crucify him. And and Peter says, this one whom you crucified, God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus. And of course, then they are troubled. Verse 37, now when they heard this, they were pierced to the heart. And said to Peter and to the rest of the apostles, Brethren, what shall we do? What can we do to be delivered? How can we be saved from the clear wrath of God that will fall upon us for this? And Peter said to them, remember after he's preached the gospel, after he's preached Jesus, he says, Repent, and each of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Evangelism must The sermon, the preaching of the gospel, however it happens, one-on-one, it doesn't matter, but evangelism must precede baptism. You cannot baptize, you can't make disciples without evangelizing. Much the same we hear in Romans chapter 10 when when Paul says, how are they going to hear? How are they going to be saved if they don't believe? How are they going to believe if they don't hear? How are they going to hear if somebody's not sent to them to preach the gospel? And Paul says, so then how beautiful are the feet of those who carry the good news Have you ever longed to be beloved in somebody's eyes, to be cherished? Maybe ladies more than guys, I don't know, but to be looked at as beautiful. And we have the testimony of God the Father, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring the good news. You want to be beautiful before God's eyes. You want to to do things where he looks down and says, that is lovely, that is beautiful. I love to see that. It warms my heart. Share the gospel with somebody. Proclaim to them the most loving thing that you could ever proclaim to them. There is an inherent beauty in people who love, is there not? Somebody who's just a loving and kind person. Have you ever been at a memorial service for somebody like that? And people are just, they're there in the droves and the testimony over and over again. It makes your heart warm. It brings you to tears because there is an inherent beauty in love. And so if you want to be beautiful... Do the most loving thing that you could do and do it over and over again. Tell people about Jesus. Tell people how to avoid the wrath to come, how to find everlasting and eternal hope in the presence of him at whom's right hand are pleasures forevermore. And so evangelism must always precede baptism. And then keep in mind, and we want to look at this, sometimes we miss this, but the progression of the text here, 
what Jesus says. He says, make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to observe all that I commanded them. We don't want to get the cart before the horse. If, if we're a church that says we take serious that command to teach people to observe all that Jesus commanded them, if we are a church that is serious about teaching, we must be a church that is serious about evangelism or we don't have people to teach. Now, of course, we can continue to raise up the next generation and we must. There are clear scriptural commandments to do that. But when Jesus talks to his church about making disciples, the standard normative practice that he has in mind is go evangelize, share the gospel, see people, first generation Christians, people who haven't been in the church, see them come to faith, get baptized, and then instruct them to obey all that Jesus commanded. And and the first thing that we instruct them to obey is the thing that we just demonstrated to them. Go and make disciples. And so we see here that evangelism is absolutely central to the mission of the church. I want to turn next. I want to turn next to the book of Acts. Acts chapter 1. We're going to be looking at verse 8 specifically. We want to think about, so we've looked at the centrality through Jesus' commission of evangelism to the life of the church, but oftentimes when we talk about the church, we talk about what it means to be the new covenant people of God, one of the greatest blessings, if not the greatest blessing, probably the greatest blessing, I don't know why I'm saying one of the, is the gift of the Holy Spirit, the indwelling, abiding presence of God as revealed in Jesus Christ in his people By virtue of the Holy Spirit indwelling us. God himself dwelling with us. What an amazing gift. And we ask ourselves, that's amazing. Why? Why are you doing that, God? Look at Acts chapter 1, verse 8. The disciples coming to Jesus. And it's interesting. The disciples often ask questions in such a way as to try and promote their agenda. And so do I at times. We all do this. Here's the good news. Jesus wasn't falling for it. I don't know if you guys knew this, and this is good for us to keep in mind. It's really hard to pull the wool over Jesus' eyes. As a matter of fact, I'm fairly confident I can say it's absolutely impossible. Disciples never got away with it. The Pharisees sure as heck did not get away with it. Jesus had some choice words for them, and me and you, we don't get get away with it either. No matter how much we self justify what we're doing, no matter how much we rationalize our lack of involvement, engagement with the church or any sin that we might be caught in, we're not pulling the wool over Jesus' eyes. It doesn't matter. That's just a little side note. Let's close that. But the disciples, they're with Jesus and they ask him the question, is it now, Lord, that you're going to restore the kingdom to Israel, all of its glory? Are you going to finally get rid of these Romans? I mean, whew, I'm thankful for that death. We're starting to get that. Your resurrection, this is great. But now, right? Now you're wiping out these knuckleheads and we can see this thing restored to the way it was. Jesus responds, verse 7, it's not for you to know the times or epochs which the Father has fixed by his own authority. Okay, so Jesus is saying, I don't even want you guys worrying about that. Don't think about that. that, This is not a topic for discussion. Forget about it. This is not what we're focused on. Well, then Jesus, what? But, verse 8, You will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you shall be my witnesses. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you and you shall be my witnesses. So don't worry about whether or not God's taken out the Romans or how the kingdom on earth, all the... Here's what you worry about, Christian. Me, you, the apostles, the disciples, generations after us, if the Lord should tarry. Be my witness. Be my witness. And here's the beauty. The Holy Spirit will be given to each and every Christian and it will empower us. And it will empower us in such a way that it will transform us. And what this text is saying is not that we will just be those who will do the activity of witnessing, but it says that 
by virtue of the power of the Holy Spirit, we will be his witnesses. In other words, we will be transformed in our very nature into conformity with the image of Jesus. We will be born again, new creatures, for the purpose that we, because of who we are, will witness to Jesus. And because who we are witnesses to Jesus, then of course in our activity we will testify to Jesus. Because we have been changed for that purpose. We will be the witnesses of Jesus. Now, think about this. This idea of the Holy Spirit. Think about the gift of the Holy Spirit. What is the gift of the Holy Spirit? Well, one thing that we see reoccurring is that this gift is called the promise. If you look in Ephesians chapter 1, and you don't have to turn here. I'm going to maybe go a little quicker through this. But Ephesians chapter 1, verses 13 and 14, we read this. In him, that is Christ, you also, after listening to the message of truth... The gospel of your salvation, having also believed, you were sealed with him in the Holy Spirit of promise. So there's this idea of the the Spirit was the promised new covenant blessing from God for his people. And here Paul says you were sealed in him. Think of a a seal that a king would put on something. It, It identifies that as belonging to that person. We are sealed. We belong to God. We come with the protection and the authority of God. He has sealed us and marked us out as his own by virtue of the Spirit within us. What a gift. Paul goes on, though, that's not all. Who the Spirit is given as a pledge of our inheritance. The Spirit has been given to you and to me. has been given to the church as a pledge, a down payment, a guarantee that God will be bringing about the fulfillment, the ultimate and full fulfillment of all of the promised blessings that he has made to his people, and he's given you the Spirit as a down payment. It's a pledge in good faith of God, omnipotent, almighty, creator, and sustainer of all things, that the blessings are yours. And so earlier in Ephesians chapter 1, Paul can say that we have inherited all the spiritual blessings in the heavenly places. You lack nothing You know, we've been going through the book of Hebrews in Friday night at our house, and it talks about this idea that a covenant or a testament, are you guys familiar with the word testament? And I don't mean New Testament, but think last will and testament. When those happens, what happens when there's a last will and testament? Is that when the person dies, the inheritance comes. And Jesus has been made the mediator of a better testament, enacted on better promises. And Jesus has brought about The author of Hebrews tells us the reception of those blessings and that inheritance through his death. Because, of course, we all know that a last will and testament, a testament is not valid until somebody, what, dies. If Charles graciously leaves me everything that he has, are you getting that on camera? I can't just go up to him and say, okay, take in the house, get out of here. If he did that, if he left it to me, which he emphatically shaked no, I would have to wait until he was with Jesus. And then he wouldn't care what I did with this. So you could leave it to me. I'm just kidding, Tabby, wherever you are. Uh, The point is, is that the Spirit has been given as a seal, as a down payment to our inheritance with a view to the redemption of God's own possession to the praise of his glory. That spirit has been given to us and God has given to us so much with the spirit. But then when we ask why, that's the what. What is it? It's a seal, it's a pledge, it's a down payment, it's a guarantee. It brings about our holiness. It does all of these things for us. Why though? And Acts 1.8 answers the question of why the Holy Spirit. So that when the power of the Holy Spirit comes upon us and transforms us, we will be the witnesses to Jesus Christ. The why of the gift of the Holy Spirit is that we would make Christ known. That we would be those zealous to live our lives in every aspect of our lives to make Jesus Christ known. And if we will do that, it will be impossible for us to not be the most loving people in the world. 
It has always been the testimony of Christian love, which is a testimony to the self-giving, self-sacrificing love of God through Jesus Christ. It has been the love of Christians that has transformed the world. It has been the love of Christians that have brought the most hardened and ruthless people to their knees in tears, crying out in faith and repentance for the mercy of God and changing their life changing their communities, changing their societies, changing their countries, and ultimately, at times, changing the world itself. One more text we want to look at. John chapter 17. Just turn a few pages back to the book of John. John John chapter 17 is oftentimes referred to as the high priestly prayer of Jesus. It is Jesus' last moments and his prayer, that last bit of the upper room discourse before Jesus is led to, leads himself, goes to the Mount of Olives, is ultimately handed over by the betrayer, by Judas, one of his very own, and then ultimately into the hands of Pontius Pilate. And because of the persistent work of his own people, the people that he came to and for, the ones who rejected him, who received him not, is ultimately hung upon a Roman cross to die this death. And Jesus, knowing full well was about what was about to come, embracing it, having lived his entire life and done every miracle that he'd ever done, said every word that he ever said, orchestrated every situation that he had ever orchestrated, all for that purpose, all for the purpose of the cross. This is what Jesus prays. I'm going to begin reading in verse 13. We read this, but now Jesus says, I come to you. And these things I have spoken in the world so that they may have my joy made full in themselves. And just pause for a moment right there. I'm going to keep reading in just a second. But keep in mind that Jesus says what he says. Jesus calls us to what he calls us to. And he says right here explicitly, this will be for their joy, for my joy in them made full. That we could experience the very joy of the, of the most beautiful, safe, self-sustained, self-fulfilling, overflowing source of joy in all of the universe. God himself in the person of Christ. Jesus says, my joy can be in you and it can be full. Are you lacking joy today? Have you been beat down? Has life been hard? Are you wearied? Are you burdened? Do you find yourself looking in the mirror, smiling far less than frowning or looking like you're in anguish? Do you want joy? Jesus says, I've prayed for it. I've died for it. And I've offered it freely and fully. That's amazing. When things are offered freely, they're never offered fully. I get, you get these all the time. They pop up, your free trial offer. Three months of free service and then $40,399,000 a month after that. If it's offered freely, it's never offered fully. And if it's offered fully, it's never offered freely unless it comes from Jesus. And then the only way to get it fully is to receive it freely. And you can't mix it up. Picking back up, verse 14. I have given them your word, and the world has hated them. Don't be alarmed, loved ones, when the world despises you for your faith. Don't be alarmed when you have to make a clear stand for the truth of the gospel, and there are repercussions for it. Be alarmed if at times you haven't been hated. Be alarmed if you've gone through your whole life and never felt the fire of persecution because the zeal of righteousness has moved you in a certain direction. Be alarmed when that happens, but not when you're hated. Jesus says, rejoice and be glad for in the same way they treated the prophets before you. If you're persecuted for righteousness, call me, we'll throw a party. We can use Charles's house. We can use anybody's house. Don't be alarmed. It's good. Picking back up, the world hated them because they are not of the world. And here's the kicker. Even as I am not of the world, you want the joy of Jesus that's offered freely? Then we must be like unto Jesus. We must be not of the world even as he is not of the world. But then here's the kicker. Jesus never asks us To be not of the world, separated from the world. 
When he tells us to be not of the world, he doesn't mean removed from the world. As a matter of fact, Jesus is going going to go on to say in verse 15, I do not ask you to take them out of the world, but to keep them from the evil one. The testimony of scripture is this. We are to be not of the world, and hear this, for the sake of the world. The way that we can love the world the most is to be not of the world, to remain in the world, but to be different from the world, to remain in the realm of darkness and depravity, and by God's grace and the mighty power of the Holy Spirit to shine as lights, proclaiming a better way, a greater hope, full enjoyment, peace and joy offered by Jesus, happiness and all that comes with who Christ is in the midst of a broken, painful, hurting world. He calls us to be light in the world. So he prays, Father, don't. Jesus prayed this to the Father. Don't take them out of the world. Don't hide them in a corner. How in the world can a city set on a hill not shine its light? How can it be hidden? How can people not see it? You do not light a lamp, Jesus said, to hide it under a basket. We are the light in the Lord. The light of Jesus is in us and the purpose is that we would shine in the midst of darkness. You do not light a lamp where it's light. All you're doing at that point is wasting wax and wick. You light a lamp in darkness to shine a light. So Jesus says, Father, don't take them out of the world. Keep them from the evil one. Because if we're kept from the evil one, then we can maintain light, right? The evil one is death, darkness. Keep them from that. Don't diminish, don't extinguish their light, but don't take them out of the world for goodness sake. That's the world that you sent me to save. Verse 16. Again, again, hear this. They are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. Jesus was not of the world, heavenly, the king of heaven. And the way that Jesus showed himself to be not of the world was to come into the world, to become like us, to relate with us, to live in the muck and the mire of the sin and the brokenness of this world, all of God's beautiful creation that we had ruined and decimated. Jesus says, I'm coming in there. I'm coming for them. I'm coming to that place. I'm getting my sleeves rolled up. I'm getting my boots dirty. And I'm going there, and that's how I'm going to be not of the world. How? Because I'm going to care enough about them to make a difference. I'm going to come. And Jesus did, of course, what we could never do in atoning for the sin of all those who would ever place their faith and trust in him. But he gives us an example. He tells us what it looks like to not be of the world, but to not be removed from the world as well. Verse 17, Jesus says, sanctify them, set them apart in the truth, Your word is truth. And we're going to see this is the word of God in all of its embodied form that Jesus has brought to mankind through his incarnation, through his ministry, his death and resurrection, and ultimately through his ascension later. But he says, sanctify them in truth. Your word is truth. It was the word of God that sent Jesus How do we know that? Look at what he says right after that in verse 18. As you sent me into the world, Father, sanctify them in truth. Your word is truth. Well, what word are we talking about? Well, of course, it embodies all of what Jesus has passed on to the disciples, to his apostles, to all of those who come after it, but it cannot be severed from this word. You have sent me. You have have commanded me. You have sent me to go. I have heeded your word. Jesus says this, as you have sent me into the world, I also have sent them into the world. You and me have a binding commission from Jesus. If you sit here today and you have come to Christ, he is your Lord, he is your Savior, you are a Christian, you say, Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. If that's you, there is a divine commission on your life. You're sent to the world 
for the purpose of making salvation known in the same way that Jesus was sent. Now, you can't accomplish what he accomplished, but amen, you don't have to. His was a once-for-all sacrifice that dealt with the sin problem. So you are sent to proclaim what he has done. We're all sent to do that. This is what the church is to be about, the proclamation of the gospel. And here's the beauty. Remember what Jesus said. It's for the purpose of my joy being in you and your joy being full. You want your joy to be full. Make Christ known. It's so simple, it's hard. Things get that way, don't they? It's so simple, it just just seems hard. So let's close with this. Conclusion, application. Grace Baptist Church, and if you're here visiting, and you're a Christian and you attend another church, then just put in your church's name here. Put in your family name, whatever. But as a church, we need to commit to making evangelism and community outreach to our community, our community, where God has sovereignly placed Grace Baptist. This must be the central focus of the life of the church. We just need to let that settle for a minute. When it is, it will be represented in our actions, in our prayers, in the way we envision ministry, It will be represented in our budget, in every aspect of what it means to be a church. And I say this for the glory of Christ and for the love of the church. We don't need, as a society, more established churches shutting their doors. And all of us, I I tell people this all the time, we've got to be careful, I've got to be careful, all of us have to be careful to, to, to turn a blind eye to history to think that somehow we or I am above the mistakes or, and sometimes they're not even mistakes, it's just getting off track a little bit. You ever done that? I do that driving sometimes. You just take one little veer off track and you don't seem to be going that far off and and one degree off is not a big deal over five feet. I used to survey for a living. You you get one degree off over five feet, not a big deal. You know, maybe you're right here and so you do that over 47 miles. Who knows where you are at that point? We need to commit as a church to keeping outreach and evangelism as the central focus. Next, Christian brother or sister, individual Christian, we need to understand that this outreach and evangelism is the purpose that each one of us are here. So whether it be in work, with your neighbors, whatever it may be, we need to commit Now, this doesn't mean that as we commit to evangelism that every other word out of our mouth needs to be Jesus died for your sins. Sometimes the best way to embark on the evangelistic journey and effort is to actually listen to people, to hear them. Jesus was compassionate. Jesus cared when people were hurting. And not every one of Jesus' evangelistic approaches was repent, you're a sinner, Sin was always involved. It's always there. It's underlying. And and people need to know about sin. But but Jesus would listen. He would deal with people differently depending on who the person and the situation was. But this is the point. Commit. Make a resolution this new year to understand that every bit of who we are is for this purpose. Every conversation that we have is for the purpose of making Christ known. And whether it's a foundational relationship building conversation, that, that... Think about those words, relationship building conversation. The whole point of that conversation is to strengthen the relationship enough that that I will be able to faithfully share the gospel to them. Oftentimes, God will weigh it on your heart just initially to share the gospel. Amen. But my point is this, is that everything that we do must be a calculated decision for the gospel, which is why I had Greg read that text this morning where Paul says, I do all things for the sake of the gospel. Though I am free of all men, I have freedom in Christ. I have been set free from any bondage and slavery. I willingly make myself a servant of all men, a slave to all men, so that by all means I may save some. Can we say that? Can I say that? We need to do that. We need to be willing to serve people with that kind of commitment. The only way we'll do that, loved ones, It's if we can look into the face of Christ and see that glory, see that love and that compassion of him who would descend from the heights of heaven, 
from, from the praises of the angels of God that had showered him throughout all creation and the internal working of the Trinity that had been his fellowship and home throughout all of eternity, for him who would step down from that, who would lay aside his glory, who would empty himself by taking on humanity, coming in the form of a bondservant, and he would humble himself to the point of death for us in our place, not because he had done anything wrong, but because we deserved eternal condemnation, but that he would humble himself because he loved us, because he cared about us, because when he looked out over the plains and the people came to him, and they didn't even necessarily know what he was talking about, you know what he saw? He saw a sheep without a shepherd. He had compassion. He loved them. This is the Christ. He took on flesh and he did everything that he did. Jesus, like he calls us to do, made calculated decisions and every one of those decisions did not lead him out of the fire but landed him on the cross. And he did it because he loved you and he loved me. He was heartbroken over the hurt in this world that sin brings. And when the Father said, who will go? Jesus, echoed by Isaiah, of course, says, here am I, send me. And he goes. And out of love, he dies for us. And it's not just the physical death, it's the bearing of the weight of God's wrath for all of eternity, for all of those people in one person, in a moment of time, can you even imagine the immensity of what Jesus took that day on the cross? And he did it for the joy set before him, despising the shame. He did it for you and me. The joy set before him, loved ones, was you. You were the motivation, the joy that moved him, that the Father is glorified. It's the will of the Father. It's the heart of the Father that is made known. It's the glory of the Father that is revealed when the love of God is displayed in that way. And he loved us. It's that love that motivates us to do this. How could we be silent? How can we do that? And so the church has to remember that is our central and most basic calling to evangelize, to make Christ known. And then we get to rejoice together with that joy. You ever walked into a witnessing situation and I am done after this, I promise. And you go in with fear and trembling. But you do it. You stand for Jesus. And no matter what the outcome is, almost inevitably you walk away feeling good. And you got to go tell somebody, I just got a chance. Can we pray for this person? I shared Jesus with them. That joy can be ours all the time. It can be full. And so we, we need to commit together. Let's pray and do that right now. Father, we pray, we ask that you would commit us to this. Lord, that we would be about making Christ known to the lost world, specifically to this community here. Lord, and that wherever you have us and wherever you may send us, oh God, that this is what we would do that we would understand this is the mission of the church, that we would make Christ known and that evangelism is central, always has been and always will be to what you're doing and that it is a gift to us to take part in this. You don't need us, but Lord, how kind it is that you desire to give us the joy of Christ in us as you send us, as you have sent Jesus. And we praise you and thank you in Jesus' name, amen.